Luke chapter 4 and verse 18. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them who are bruised. And we're going to minister tonight just a few moments and study the subject of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is, of course, in the text, is Jesus Christ himself. And I think to establish this truth, it's important for us to understand who Christ was. And everyone in this place who say we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Everybody who, who's here tonight I know believes that. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. We believe uh, he died on the cross. We believe he rose from the dead and that he's now seated by the right hand of the Father. Listen, if you believe that, you're saved. Amen. Nothing has to be added to that. Now, that's important to what I'm going to teach tonight and maybe the coming weeks. It's important, I believe, that we understand salvation. If we don't understand salvation, we will misunderstand the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We'll misunderstand the anointing of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of teaching uh, that teaches a lot of things that are false that says that you have to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to go to heaven. You got to speak in tongues in order to be saved. These are things that you got to be careful with as a believer because it will really take away from the finished work of the cross. You're saved because of the cross. Amen. You're not saved because you speak in tongues. Amen. I need you to get that. Amen. You're not victorious. You're, you don't have <laughs> salvation and eternal life because you speak in tongues. You have eternal life. You can walk in victory, live free from the impact and power of sin because you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. It is important as a believer that we understand that. If we misunderstand that, we will overemphasize uh, as the means of victory. We will overemphasize the object of our faith, which is supposed to be the cross of Christ, not the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The object of your faith as a believer should be what Jesus did at Calvary, not in the second work of grace called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I'm saying all of that to help us understand. The anointing does not make you saved. You can only have the anointing if you are saved. You got to get what I'm telling you. Some people misunderstand uh, the anointing. The anointing, let me give you a brief definition. And we'll go into it a little further. It's really the presence of God uh, that is upon an individual to help that individual carry out the work that God has called that person to do. Talent can get you in the door. Talent can open a lot of doors for you. But the anointing is what changes lives. It's the anointing, the Bible says, that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing upon a singer that can change a heart that's sitting in a service. It's the anointing that is upon a preacher that can save the sinner, that can deliver the saint, that can see a person come through a tragic situation in their lives. It is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is upon you. If you stand in any pulpit and preach the gospel and God moves, you better rest assured that's not talent. I said if God moves. I didn't say if the people were moved with emotion. Come on. Yeah. People can get emotional with talent. People can weep in service. Just because somebody breaks down and cries in service doesn't mean the anointing is present. We're emotional people. There are people who break out. My son and I just left to Graceland in Memphis, Tennessee. We watched clips of Elvis Presley. Folk were crying and weeping at his concerts. He was singing about blue suede shoes. I can just about guarantee you that was not the anointing of the Holy Spirit Amen. that made those women break down and cry come like on, that. Come on, come on. There was no life-changing power in blue suede shoes. I'm sorry for Elvis fans. The life-changing power is in the person and work of the Holy Spirit who works exclusively through what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. The cross was a reality. 
The Holy Spirit is who brings that reality to fallen humanity. He reveals Jesus to you. Remember, Jesus said when he taught on the Holy Spirit, he will not speak of himself, but he will speak of me. He comes to glorify me. I'm going to give you another comforter, and when he's come, he's going to show you me. The Holy Spirit will point every human being to Jesus Christ. Well, who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for our sins. So... Number one, I've got to understand I'm saved. How am I saved? I believe something. I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, and I put my faith in that. I believe that. And because of that, God gives me eternal life. He gives me the righteousness of God. I am justified by faith. And because I am justified, now think about this. That opens the door. Salvation opens the door. When you got saved, it doesn't have to stop there. Amen. When you got saved, you got, if we can use this terminology, you got a ticket to heaven. Nothing else has to happen, honestly, in this earth for you to go to heaven other than you getting saved. That's right. You don't have to ever speak in tongues. You don't ever have to lay hands on anybody. You don't ever have to do any of those things. You are saved because you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if I'm going to be a Christian, if I'm going to labor as a Christian, if I'm going to be effective, at, remember, I'm already a Christian, so I'm not trying to be a Christian. But if I'm going to be effective as a Christian, I need the person and work of the Holy Spirit to help me do what I need to do. Remember who said the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. It is Jesus. As a man, Jesus needed the Holy Spirit. I think that should just, we should just stop and think about that for a moment. The Son of God, God manifest in the flesh, a man who had never sinned in thought, word, or deed, that disqualifies all of us in this place just with that statement alone. Yeah, that's right. He has never sinned. He is literally God manifest in the flesh. Jesus never lost the possession of his deity. He was always God. He never functioned as God, but he was always God. But he never, you, he never expressed himself as God. You understand what I'm saying? Jesus never lost the possession of his deity. He laid it aside as a man because as a man, he had to go to the cross. As a man, he had to live a sinless life for you and for me, not for himself, not for the host in heaven, but he lived a sinless life for you and for me. He did all of that because it took that for us to become the righteousness of God. Do you realize if Jesus had have sinned, we would be lost? Yeah. Somebody said, wait a minute, if... No, that's impossible. You better go back and read your Bible. Jesus could have sinned, but thank God he didn't. As a man, as God, he can't sin. We got to think about that now. But as a man, remember Satan said, turn these stones into bread. If Jesus had have done that, that I'm not, that, get out of your mind homosexuality. Get out of your mind Fornication. That's not what kind of sin I'm talking about. I'm talking about stepping outside of the will of God, doing something that God didn't tell him to do. That would have been sin. God didn't tell Jesus to turn stones into bread. So had he done that, the redemptive plan would have been messed up. We as human beings would have no way of being redeemed. Everything that we ever needed, it rested upon Jesus Christ. The entirety of the plan of God rested upon Jesus Christ. And because he lived perfectly in an imperfect world, it had to be this way because it took a sinless birth, a perfect birth for us to be accepted by God. It took a sinless life for us to be accepted by God. We're disqualified on the first two. <laughs> perfect birth, sinless life. How many of you, come on now. Right. Psalm 51.5 disqualifies us. Remember, mm -hmm. David said, I was conceived in sin, yeah. shaped in iniquity. Mm -hmm. Romans 3.23, disqualified. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Disqualified. Humanity is disqualified. We couldn't be what God required. 
So it took a perfect birth. Jesus did that. That which is conceived in her is not a man. Matthew chapter 1, it is of the Holy Spirit. It was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was birthed by the Holy Spirit. He lived a sinless life up until the day that he died, and he did all of that on behalf of all of humanity. Read Isaiah chapter 53, and remember, he bore our transgression, not his own. Mm. He took him who knew no sin and made him to be sin. Peter said there was no guile found in his mouth. He was sinless. At 30 years old, he was baptized in the Jordan River. Now, I want you to think about something. What happened from the day he was born up until the day he was baptized? He was here. He was living. Yeah. But remember, he never sinned. I want you to keep that in mind. He never sinned in thought, word, or deed. Mm -hmm. But at 30 years old, he was baptized in the Jordan River. The Bible says that the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dog. Now, the first thing that happened when Jesus had the Holy Spirit to rest upon him, to fall upon him, to fill him. Remember, you got to read John 3.34. The Bible says he was filled without measure. No person can say that. Yeah. Every one of us and every prophet that's ever lived have the Holy Spirit, but it's with a certain measure. Right. Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure. Hence, all of the miracles everywhere he went, there were miracles being performed. The Spirit descended upon him like a dove. The first thing that happened, if you read the Gospels, he was led into the wilderness. Yeah, right. Why wasn't he led to start a church? <laughs> Why wasn't he led to lay hands on somebody and see them healed? He was led into the wilderness to be tried. Mama. Have you been tried yet? Ooh. Think about this now. See, it's, it's one thing. Oh, I got the Holy Spirit. God has called me. He confirmed the call. We're ready. But guess what the Holy Spirit is going to do? Mm. He's going to lead you into the wilderness first. Yeah. But the Bible also says when Jesus came out of the wilderness, it's not God's will for you to stay there. Right. That's right. Jesus came out of the wilderness, but look what it said. Now, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. The Spirit led him in the wilderness, but he came out of the wilderness in the power of yeah. the Holy Spirit. Oh, you, right. you got to get that tonight. Yeah. When you come out, you come out with power. Yes. The Holy Spirit is there. Remember, he was already the Son of God. The Spirit didn't descend upon him to make him the Son of God. He was already the Son of God. But he needed the Spirit to carry out the work. Oh, you got to get that tonight. He needed the Spirit to lay hands on the sick and they recover. He needed the Spirit, go back to the text, to preach deliverance to the captive. He needed the Spirit to heal the brokenhearted. He needed the Spirit to preach deliverance and those who were set at naught to be set free. He needed the Spirit for the work. The Holy Spirit is not ten different people. It's one Holy Spirit. When you got saved, he came into your heart to start impacting and affecting your sanctification. You need the Holy Spirit to live victory, live victorious, I'm sorry, over sin. Right. He doesn't wait for you to start speaking in tongues for him to start Come working. On. You got to hear that now. He right. doesn't wait for you to shun the level for him to start. No, when you said, yes, Jesus, guess what? The Holy yeah. Spirit came into your heart and started changing you right. Right. instantly. She would say, I don't believe that. Mm. Think about your life. Mm. Mm. I don't know what you got saved out of. But I know my life. I was foul. Yeah. Had a very foul mouth. I cussed every day. The day I got saved. I got baptized with the Holy Spirit about six weeks after I got saved. But the day I got saved, I went to my brother's house. I almost got stung by a bee. I didn't say, oh, Jesus. Some of you didn't get that, but I'm not going to tell you what I said. I ducked and said, oh, and I, the next word that came out of my mouth wasn't godly. For the first time my whole life, I got convicted. Yeah. I wasn't tongue talking, though. Right, right. Mm. Think about it. He was already there. Right. He was already working. Instantly, I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Okay. 
The day I got saved, I had plans. Guess what happened? I canceled those plans that day because the Holy Spirit had started work. No, you can't do that. You got to let this go. You got to cut this out. He instantly, he started working. Yes. So I'm not speaking in tongues because I need victory over sin. That happened 2,000 years ago yeah, at on. Calvary. Calvary cleaned me out so the Holy Spirit can take up residence yeah. in me. And because he is in me, he is working in me. Me to live this Christian life. I need the baptism which is evidenced by me speaking with other tongues because guess what needs to happen? Work needs to be done. Preaching has to be done. Laboring has to be done. Witnessing to the lost has to be done. Laying hands on the sick has to be done. Casting out devils has I need the baptism for service. And if I'm going to be the kind of Christian that I need to be for the Lord as it regards the work of God, I need the help of God. Do you think you just need his help to get saved? You need his help to get saved, stay saved? I mean, we can just go on and on about that. We need his help to uh, minister, to witness, to lay hands on the sick. Every preacher, I don't have to go around and ask But every time I stand in this pulpit, before I get to the pulpit, you know what I ask for? The anointing. Yeah. Amen. Why? Because I can't do this without it. Right. Nobody's going to be impacted. Nobody's going to be changed. No one is going to be touched if I don't have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I can get up here and talk to you for 30 minutes. Come on. Anybody can get up here and do that. Yeah. There are some, I'm not a great orator. There are some people in the world who have great speaking gifts. They have never been born again, but they can move a crowd when they talk. Come on now. Y'all ever go to one of Barack Obama's or have saw him on TV when he was running for president? Oh, God. Did you see how those people were shouting and screaming? Guess why? Because the man can talk. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that was the anointing of the Holy Come Spirit. On. He can move the crowd because he's got a gift. So with a gift, you can move the crowd, but with the Holy Spirit, you can change a life. Yeah. I don't want to move the yeah. crowd. I want to see somebody's life change. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we, I'm tired of the crowd getting moved. We can move the crowd with an A flat and a hum and a, all of this stuff. But if somebody is going to be changed, it's going to be because of the anointing of the Spirit that is on your life. Amen. He takes you where you can't go. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good, casting out devils, healing the sick. Why? Because he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Everything Jesus did, he did it as a man who was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Peter's mother-in-law was dying. Jesus laid his hands on her. Rebukes the fever. She's healed instantly. A man baptized in the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Spirit, going about doing good because he had the presence of God on him. Lazarus dies four days. He's dead. Jesus walks to the tomb, says, Lazarus, come forth. That happened as a man who was filled with the Spirit, anointed by the Spirit. The widow's son at Nain rose from the dead. Jairus' daughter rose from the dead. While he was headed to heal Jairus' daughter, the woman with the issue of blood touched him. Yeah. She was healed. Why? Because it was a man who was anointed by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and it, because of that, the Bible tells us it was the miracles and all of this stuff. It happened because a man was yielded to God. I heard a message today. It was a clip from a message. Many of you heard of David Wilkerson. Mm -hmm. The message is entitled Men of a Different Sort. And not talking about gender, of course. He's talking about mankind. And he posed so many questions. And I, I'm not kidding. When I heard the clip, I, I literally was moved to tears because the cry that was in him, he's gone home to be with the Lord. He died, unfortunately, in a car accident in 2011. But God used him mightily. If you've ever heard the name Nikki Cruz, 
who was a violent drug dealer, violent gang member, violent murderer, was saved under his ministry. And he said, when I look at the Bible and I look in the Old Testament, I look through church history, he said, I have to wonder, how did these men become men of a different sort? How did they walk in the anointing? How can somebody fast 40 days and 40 nights? He said, I can barely make it three days. He said, when you start searching scripture, he said, there is something about these individuals that stands out. There was an authority that they walked in. I was reading today, when you read the book of Luke, round chapter 2 or 3, I can't remember. There was a woman by the name of Anna. The Bible says she was a prophetess. But women can't preach, though. <laughs> <laughs> she was a prophetess. You know what her life was? She was over 100 years old. She had been a widow for 84 years. Think about that. She never remarried when her husband died. 84 years, her life was spent fasting and praying day in and day out. Are you willing to devote your life to God? I want to talk to you. Are you willing to vote to devote your whole being to God, even at the expense. I'm not kicking marriage. Do not take this the wrong way. So don't. But what if God says, I don't want you to marry? Mm -hmm. What if? I'm saying what if. I'm hypothetical, so that doesn't say God told you. I wouldn't dare do that. That's right. What if God told you, give up your career? The one you worked so hard to attain. What if he said, young man, don't go to college. Young woman, don't go to college. Seek me. Seek me day in and day out. I mean, and, and I, I mean, when I read it, the, the presence of God came all over me. I mean, she was literally living in the temple. She fasted and prayed day in and day out. I read Acts chapter 4, and I, and I start to... Something is starting to, I, I don't know, I, I can't really put it all into words yet, but I, I heard Brother David say this. He said, I'm not that man, but I want to be that man. When he said that, I, I felt that. Yeah. I said, Lord, I'm not that man of another sort yet, yeah. but I want to be that man. Amen. I don't know about you, but I, I, I mean, you've got to be, I'm not there. I'm not to that life where I'm consecrated like I need to be. Like, I, I mean, it's day in and day out just in the presence of God, but I'm saying, Lord, I want to be. I don't know what is going to have to happen. I don't know what has to leave my life, who has to leave my life, what I have to give up. But God, I want to be a person that your anointing can rest upon. I want you to entrust your glory and your presence upon me. I, I don't know about you. I want to preach and see a person jump out of a wheelchair. Not so somebody can say, oh, Torrance no. Nash is anointed, and when he walks in the room, people, no, no. I want people to see Jesus. I can remember the vision God showed me, and God showed me me standing in front of a cross, but God showed me a great fall, and when I stood back up, I was standing behind the cross, yeah. and God spoke to me and said, if you're going to be what you ought to be, they're going to have to see me and not you. They're going to have to see what I did for them and not what you can can do for them and we've got a lot of preachers who have proven what we can do for you but if we point you to Christ it's a whole lot more that can be done if you can see the cross yes. Amen. day in and day out you look at Elijah he's in Cherith no food nothing just him and God God said, I'll, I'll keep you. I'll send a raven to feed you if you trust me. Can you trust God in Cherith? It's, I'm, I, I'm being honest with you. I, I remember when, you know, it was one thing God told me. He said, I want you to leave your job. And I said, I'll do it. Yes, I, I walked away. But God spoke to me again and said, I don't want you to just leave your job. I want you to cut ties with warehouses. I don't want you to take any disability. I said, but Lord, I can get all the disability money. I mean, I can go out on leave. and No, I want you to walk away from all of it and trust me. How? How can I do that? How can I? 
I'm not where I need to be, but I can tell you one thing tonight. God has been faithful. God has paid every bill. I said, God, I said, God has, I had manipulation. I mean, I, I don't know how to explain it, but when people walk up to you and say, God bless you. And I mean, it takes care of the need because that's the kind of God that we serve. Amen. But Anna, I mean, Anna blows my mind. I mean, I can't, I'm sorry, saints. She said, I'm going to give, I don't want to get remarried. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to seek God. And all she wanted to do was see Jesus. When he was born, she, was one, she had one of the privileges of seeing Jesus, adorning him when he was a baby. Mm. Would you give up your life to see Jesus? Come on, somebody. Would you give up your life? I mean, everything people thought you would be. Man, I thought you were the best this in your class. I thought you had this going for Will you give it up? For the anointing wow. of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God resting upon me to help me do impossible things. You don't have to be 50. Samuel was about six, seven, eight years old, maybe. The Lord said, Samuel. Samuel finally answered and said, Here I am. Your servant hears. What do you want from me, Lord? He said, Go tell Eli. That he's sinned against me. His sons have fouled up everything. And he's left them in position. The whole fate of Israel. Brother Mike rested upon a little child. Yeah. Why? Because that child was surrendered. To God. Mama. He took the vow of a Nazarite. When he was born his mother Hannah. She prayed. Sometimes we think we got to be the loudest one in the room. The Bible says Hannah didn't say a word. She prayed silently. But God heard Right. How can God hear a silent prayer? Because God can hear your heart. When I talk about praying and having a heart of prayer, we're not talking, you can't physically be in a prayer closet all day. But you can spiritually pray. You got to drive to work. You still got to drive to wherever you do, do whatever you do. But you can have a heart of prayer and seeking the face of God throughout the day and devote your life. I mean, no is going to have to start being a popular word for a lot of us. Jesus. Right. No, I can't do it. Yeah. Come on. Not because I'm better than you, but because my life has been calling. I, mean, I don't know if Anna was asked out on the date or not. <laughs> I don't know. All I know is the Bible says, she said, I'm devoting my life to this. Because this is what God called me to do. I don't want you to do it because Anna did it. I want you to do whatever it is you do because God told you to do it. Right. Jesus was anointed. And before he died, he said, these works and greater works shall you do. Mark chapter 16, he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But if you're going to preach it, you need help to do it. You got to have the anointing. You got to have what I have. You won't have it without measure, but you need it in order to be effective. So by the time the book of Acts comes and they were in Jerusalem, listen, they were already saved. They weren't waiting there for the salvation experience. They were right, saved. Right. He said, wait in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything until you're endued with power. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were in one place on one accord. And suddenly came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the room where they were sitting. I said it filled the room. Mm -hmm. Can you think about that for a minute? Remember the book of uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. They, the Bible says they had built the temple and Solomon prayed and sought the face of God. Lord, if we get out of your will, if we, if we foul up the plan of God, if we mess it all up, would you hear from heaven and heal us? Would you just hear us if we go astray? He said there's no man who is without sin. And the Bible says and when Solomon had made an end of praying, he offered thousands of animals for sacrifice. The Bible says the glory of the Lord <clears throat> filled the house. Priests couldn't stand because of the presence. They could barely walk in to the temple 
because of the presence of God. They couldn't function because of the presence of God. Can you imagine that day when you walk in a service and the presence of God is so strong you can barely walk through the door? Mm -hmm. mm. Do you get excited because it used to happen or do you have an expectation waiting for it to happen today? And that's what I asked God. I said, Lord, I don't want to just be excited because it happened at Azusa. Yeah. I want to have an expectation and be looking for it to happen today. But if I'm going to have this kind of move of God. I think about one text where they couldn't cast out a demon. The disciples said, Lord, why couldn't we cast out the demon? He said, this kind comes out by fasting and prayer. Now, we talk about prayer. You talk about prayer. The last couple of weeks, the Lord's been dealing with me about fasting. What happened? Why aren't we, we want what they had, but we're not willing to do what they did. You talk about men of a different sort. We talked about Anna. You think about Hannah. She wanted a son so bad. She said, Lord, when he's born, I'm going to give him to you. She did. Samuel came. She gave him to the temple. I just want you to bless me with a son. I'm barren and I can't have children. I'm in a place of impossible. And when she got to the place of impossible, she called possible. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mama. She called God. And Eli comes in and said, God heard you. Next year this time, you're going to have a child. Come on, somebody. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. That's the kind of God yeah. that we serve. Yeah. He is a miracle-working God. Amen. Think about this. When they told you on your school or in your job or your sports, when they told you you can make this much money or you can attain this or you can have that, what did you do? You started working towards it. Yeah. Why? Why? Because you saw what you could have. Well, I'm telling you tonight in the yeah. Bible, you don't need this witness. You've got 66 witnesses yeah. that said that God is a miracle working God. Yeah. And if my people, which are called by my name, oh, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, yeah. I will hear them. I hear that in my spirit. Yeah. I will yeah. hear you. Did you hear me? That I will hear you. If you turn from it, though, I'll hear you. I'll heal you. I'll move upon you. I'll I'll use you and listen to me. When God anoints an individual, the impossible becomes possible. Right. What do you think is impossible tonight? I was in Missouri. This 80 year, I think she was about 80 years old. She's sitting there playing the piano, keyboard. She's singing hymns. Most people walk in the church and never pay attention to her. She testified. She said, I had a rare form of cancer. It was terminal. He said, That's, the doctors gave up on her. She was done. They said, this kind of cancer has no treatment. But they didn't realize it did have a treatment. Uh, it just wasn't a treatment that was known to man. Right. <laughs> She's still in church playing the keyboard. They've run all the tests that they could and can't find a trace of that rare cancer yeah. in her body. Why yeah. is that? Because the God of the impossible, of the, I mean, he touched this woman and now she's healed by the power of God. Yeah. That power is here now. Yeah. Yes, it is. Amen. Yes, it is. Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to seek God? Tori, let me talk to myself. Because the thing about the gospel, <laughs> it makes you evaluate you. Amen. I can sit here all night and say, Brother Mike, you yeah. guys, you, you, yeah. you. But yeah. uh, you know what really changes a church? Is when people in church start looking at Christ yeah. and say, Lord, change me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. Hear me tonight. That's what changes a congregation is when the pastor, the co-pastors, everybody else starts to make those evaluations of self. Yeah. And say, Lord, I need to be changed. Amen. I've been Come trying on. to change everybody Come else, on. but I'm the one who needs yeah. to be changed. Amen. Man, Asia may not change, but I can change. Hey. I mean, Tori may not change, but you can change. Hey. You got to understand this thing. But 
if individuals will start seeking God again. Am I seeking him? Don't answer that. Don't. This is what I want you to leave with tonight. Read the book of Acts, chapter 4. I think it's chapter 4. Peter was arrested for the third time. Peter stayed in jail, saints, for preaching the gospel. My, my. It hit me the other day. The Bible didn't say they had a prayer meeting while Peter was in jail. The church stayed together and prayed day in and day out. If you found them in the morning, they were in prayer. Noonday, they were in prayer. People were losing their jobs. They said, all right, Brother Mike said, that's okay. I got a little extra money. Here you go. Yeah. That's what the church was doing. That's right. They lost their house. That's okay. You move in with us. We got one cause. We're on one accord, one purpose. What's that purpose? To see souls saved, to get the gospel out. And if we can get to that point, I'm t I don't care if it's 15 or 20 of us, it will happen if we will let God begin to work in us individually. But the church prayed together. And they were in constant prayer. Peter went to jail, they were praying. Peter was in jail all night, the Bible says. They were still there praying. Yeah. Peter got let out of jail around 3, 4, 5, or 6 in the morning. When he came to the house where they were, guess what the Bible says? And the people were in there praying. Yeah. You got to pray before the thing hits, yeah. when the thing hits, yeah. while it's going on, yeah. and when it's done. You got to yeah. stay That's in right. prayer. Right. And I believe if we'll come to that heart of no, praying no. and fasting, what we're praying for will knock on the door while we're praying. Jesus. My God, Peter knocked on the door while the people were praying. And he said, hey, I'm out here. He said, the woman came back and she, she said, uh, Peter is at the door. They said, woman, you're mad. Seriously. They said, you've gone crazy. Peter's in prison. Surely he can't be out there. She said, you got to come see this. Peter walks in. And they were rejoicing and praising God. And listen to me. When God moves, guess who's going to get the glory? God. Right. That's it. That's, That's what he it. wants. That's it. That's right. He don't want you to talk about your leadership and all of this. He just wants you to pray fast. Get in the word. Be an effective Christian. You're already saved because of the cross. Remember, I wanted to emphasize that point. I hope we have. You're saved already. Amen. I'm talking about being effective as a Christian now. You've got to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I believe the depth of that will be your consecration, your devotion to God. Are you alone with him? Are you seeking him more now than ever? Are you pushing the plate back? Pushing the plate back. Fasting is not so I'm not eating. Fasting is I have a need. And I'm willing to give up food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to give up my entertainment. So that I can hear from God. Right. That's what fasting is. There's a need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you.